I was 18. I was trying to figure it out. It was too big for me at the time. Infinite choices don't necessarily lead to better final works. Your creativity, does it thrive more on chaos or more on discipline? I think for me personally, it's, it's uh, both. Overthinking is one of the biggest problems that people say they face in their work. And all that questioning and analysis can often leave us feeling unfocused or even hopeless in the face of our goals. Yeah. Hey, can we just have one kind of hurry? Don't we saw the film there. Stop it for a second. Because I was scared as to death. So then, can I just do it one more time, though? Can I just do it one more time? A lot of the videos and articles that I've looked at when researching this piece tell us that if we can be more our instinctual selves and just release that analytic brain entirely, then creative genius is just going to kind of flow out of us. The, the more I got out of the way, I just found that music was there. It wasn't something that had to be forced. It wasn't something that, that I needed to put myself under any pressure to do. I just felt like it was just something that was happening. But although I do see that there's truth in this message, and we are in this video gonna be looking at how we can try and access more freedom when we're in that creative flow state, I do also see that there's another important and empowering side of the story to understand here. I, I would never let the analytical side of me in there. It can be very destructive. Grant me the serenity to accept the things I can't change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. If you take a look at the runtime, you can probably see that this video is going to go pretty deeply into this discussion. But I can promise you, by the end of it, you're going to walk away with three really clear takeaways and tools that you can use when you face that indecision or overthinking in your future work. The, the love for myself comes in at understanding that it's all a part of the process. And ask myself how much I'll let the fear take the wheel and steer. I'm here to teach you how to kickflip. You ready? Here we go. The reason I wanted to look at Earl in this video is because, like a lot of great artists, he knowingly admits to a sensitive and complex way that he experiences the world. That hyper-aware or analytic state that can often be said to lead to the overthinking in our work. I'm the most sensitive that's outside. I'm not going to lie to you. That's what I was saying outside yeah. to them. I was like, what if I went in there, Zane Lowe sat down and just started profusely crying right now? Yeah, <laughs> Earl came into public attention at a ridiculously early age being one of the youngest members of Odd Future. And I still remember the hype around that first album coming out. I was 18 years old, bro. Right? It was like, what? Niggas was putting like a thing on me and it was like, I don't even know if I have that much to say right now. Yeah. Like I can, I, I had the ability to manipulate words and like play with words and stuff. But in terms of content, mm. I was 18 years old. What we saw with that early work was raw talent and the makings of that complex and unique flow and vocabulary that make up some of the reasons why people love listening to Earl Sweatshirt so much. A little shicey clown is back in full effect. Little teeny tiny sweaty body just hit me by the neck. Got my fit me up as long as this is shit I should regret. But in an interview, Earl reflected on some awkward feelings that he has when he performs and celebrates that early work. It was an undercooked take, Earl said, when reflecting on some of the bars off that early album. What makes it like actually embarrassing is that you're a kid. Yeah, yeah. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah, so yeah. think about your like ideas about the world and kind of like what things are when you're a kid. With Earl's reflection on that undercooked or underworked creative expression, he perfectly flips these negative ideas around overthinking for artists and creators. Yes, we're gonna to wanna to learn how to control our analytic brain more correctly. And we're gonna look at some practical tips on how to do that a little later on. But it's not as simple as just turning it off and being more ourselves, because it's actually within the sensitivity of that tool and the energy that maybe made you click this video in the first place, that if harnessed correctly, our best and most unique creative work is gonna lie. As creative people, we can often lean towards personality traits linked with openness. 
where less open people might be able to understand the world in straight lines, good or bad decisions, my kind of thing or not my kind of thing. High levels of openness can mean that you're forced to take a look at those simple categorizations, holding space for two ideas to be true at the same time, recognizing the beauty and possibility in complexity, but also being more likely to struggle with the uncertainty that comes from all that and a natural over-analysis deciding things like who am I really or which of these lyrics best represents my true identity. It was the one Rick and Morty episode where they come, where the parents are coming back from out of town. It's the classic, like, don't f*** up the house. Yeah. They throw a party at the house. Then the n- Rick freezes time. When he unfreezes time, he quickly tells them, like, yo, if y'all aren't sure of yourself, then your existence is going to be iffy. So then it inevitably happens, and then their reality, yeah, their person is split between these two things, and both of the person, now the anxiety is like a little more, now you're like scared, and then that, then it splits again. To me, that splitting self that Earl describes there is such a great depiction of the way that overthinking works. When faced with two possible options, two different paths to follow with your work or two different ways to record a song. The open-minded brain isn't necessarily completely sure which way to go and looks instead to explore the complexity of possibilities that might lie within those different routes. But when it comes to this complexity of thinking around our work, the framing that I would try to put forward to you is not that we need to get rid of it entirely, but think of it instead as a powerful tool that we need to learn how to use correctly in order to be able to harness it and move forward and stop it from negatively turning on our work. You talk about how you can't make art if you're thinking about the outcome, or you're thinking about business, or you're thinking about how many copies it's going to sell, or what are the audience going to think? The audience comes last, not because I don't care about them or I don't like the audience. In service to the audience, they have to come last. So now we've built some awareness around the causes of overthinking. I want to share three really practical ways that we can look to harness its power and stop it from giving us that sense of overwhelm or stuckness in our work. And the first thing I want to look at is the importance of good rituals and routine when it comes to quietening down the negative sides of that hyperanalytic voice. There's a certain amount of risk. I mean, I mean that's 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 how I do all my work. If you if you um, are willing to take any type of leap into the void, you're going to experience something that you would have never experienced before. When a toddler is given three chords on the piano and asked if they want to improvise a song, it's often that they will just start up straight away and get going. But once we mature and develop a wider perspective of ourselves and the world and others we might find that that generative creative practice becomes a little bit more complex. What are we really trying to say, our brain might ask us as we step back in front of that blank canvas. If I move in this direction, will that lead to a good or bad outcome? And importantly, how are others gonna experience this work and what are they gonna think of me when they see it or hear it? I joined a band and basically like was under a tremendous amount of pressure to be liked, to be good, <laughs> you know, and. And I gradually realized that all those kind of concerns really disrupt creative thought and really stifle it, you know. We can remember here that the human brain is really designed to protect ourselves from danger and threat. And when we're doing this work, there's always going to be that smaller, more vulnerable self inside, obsessed with how others might react to what we're doing or not stepping out of line and standing out from the crowd. Kids are, they're open and they have no baggage. They don't have any belief system. They don't know how things are supposed to work. Most of us select from an endless number of data points available to us to, well, as a, as a species, to make sure that we don't die and to procreate and to feed ourselves are probably the primary functions first. And then... And then we learn things about what's right and what's wrong. And we learn things about uh, how to do certain things. Or we're inspired by someone who makes something we love and we want to do it the way they do it. And all of those things 
undermine the purity of the creative process. I said in my last video that the creative practice doesn't end at the studio door. And I think that this sentiment is really important when thinking about how we're gonna try and control that negative, vulnerable self within. They might be coming to the uh, concert as critics, but like if there's no response at all, it doesn't bother me too much at all. It just makes me play a little more music, you know. See, you know, that's, that's just the way I think. I think in no negative terms at all, because it takes up a whole lot of space in your mind. At the end of this video, I'm gonna introduce some mindfulness techniques that have actually been helpful for me when anxiety or negative self-talk comes in and tries to control my mental focus. But I think in a simple way, one of the important things we need to remember is that if we're gonna really create space for free and open expression in our creative work, then we're gonna to need to manage something of a structured and disciplined routine outside of that. The way we choose to live in the world impacts our ability to make more beautiful things. The making is a, um, it's like a reverberation of it. Try to leave yourself in a position where you do the things that you want to do with your time um, and where you take maximum advantage of your, whatever your possibilities are. I'm not saying that we need to shoot for some heroic level of execution on all of this, but despite what some people might try and sell you, making great art isn't about chaos or waking up at 3 a.m. and unloading with some singular moment of inspiration. It's more like a muscle or a groove, and the more that we make time for it and turn up for it, the more powerful we're gonna become, and the more smoothly we're gonna find we settle in to those moments of creative flow state. Nothing's expected of you, you know? You just have to, just, um, you just have to be there for it. I know my, my years of practicing guitar, they weren't really very emotional, you know? I spent a lot of time just practicing scales and learning Frank Zappa instrumentals and trying to learn the most complicated music I could. But the way my intelligence was able to, to relate to uh, and, and connect with the nature of music and the feelings that music arises, that music brings about in me, ended up making me be able to form a musical thought in my head and be able to, uh, be able to bring it out into physical reality through my instrument. The, other, the note next to the, the one that you think is bad corrects the one in front. Yes, right. Only way you can do that is by experience. Only way you can take a, a line that you didn't mean to draw is to draw every day. You, you can be able to say, well, I'll put this in. It isn't too far away from the thing. Or maybe change colors. It's just the same way of composition. By turning up for that routine day after day, the open-minded artist who finds themselves split in many other aspects of their lives can find some peace and sanctuary in the work, alive with satisfying moments of realization and understanding. Yeah, it's a, you know, input, output. And I'm always listening mm -hmm. so that I can put something out. Music makes me help, mm. uh, music helps me make sense of the world. You know, to me, Earl's music, it almost subverts the idea of performing because he doesn't even really seem to be in a way, kind of like performing. It's like, this is me, this is it. I, ca I can't be anything else with you other than just like completely unfiltered in every conceivable way, existing in every moment that you see him, you know, and, and that's like pretty much him. Moving forward now, and I wanna think a little bit about how we can best organize our own creative routines and introduce a system that I think can help us structure our tasks and harness the power of that analytic mind whilst avoiding it from coming in and affecting our access to that more free creative flow state. To set this all up, I want us to imagine the life of a successful writer, painter or musician who might be surrounded by perhaps a producer or an editor or a finance and managerial team. But for most of us who work in a less service way, it's important to understand that when managing all these roles ourselves and trying to wear all these different hats, that the best and most effective way to do this is not to put them all on at the same time. Your creativity, does it thrive more on chaos or more on discipline? I think for me personally, it's, it's uh, both. My discipline seems to be mostly in uh, when I arrange music or, or when I'm doing like collecting libraries of beats um, or, or um, the studio process is very disciplined. With my voice, for example, and my songwriting, 
is sort of the opposite. It's, it's, uh, um, where, uh, I, I would never let the analytical side of me in there because it, 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 uh, it's, it can be very destructive. On first impressions, it's easy to look at Bjork and see this ideal connected artist. But in her discussion of the two sides of her process, we can see how she too has to manage these freer generative creative states and that more analytic approach to the work. The important thing here when discussing the separation of tasks between generative and free and analytic and reflective is that when we've carved out that important time to create freely, we sit comfortably within that state, accepting the boundaries that the analytic side has drawn out for us and not allowing our minds to rehash analytic questions. When I engage in a particular project, whatever it is, I, I dedicate all of myself for that period of time, whatever it is, whether it be 20 minutes or whether it be five hours, whatever it is, total focus and no um, outside distraction whatsoever. And when I leave that process, I do my best not to think about it when I'm away from it. I don't bring any materials with me. I don't leave the studio with works in progress and spend time listening to them during the day or looking for ideas. I, I stay as far away from it when I'm not di directly engaging in it as possible. Before we put this topic to bed for the time being, I wanted to bring up one final overarching point here. And this idea is based around the need for acceptance. You know, it's like the serenity prayer, you know? Grant me the serenity to accept the things I can't change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. You know, so it's like a lot of shit you can't, you have no control over, so why f stress yourself out about it? We're traveling into fairly large territory together here, but the point around this is super clear and undoubtedly true. The human condition is defined in many ways by uncertainty. If we're gonna allow our default mind state obsessed with protecting us to just run the show in there, then there's always gonna be some anxiety that's able to enter and fill up that mental space. Another superpower of artists is, is this accepting we don't know anything. It, when we think we know things, that also limits our, our world. We think we know, it's only like this, this is all that's possible, we're mice in this little box. What works for me is just all about trying to be aware and smell out when that smaller self brain is trying to come in and control everything. When we hear that voice in our head when we're trying to work, there is a wiser and larger self that does have the choice to thank it for trying to protect us, but also remind itself that any belief that we can just control everything anyway is just essentially untrue. I find the same shit though when I'm being sensitive, if I find my like tempered, like welling up mm. it's the same shit if i can catch it mm. like on the way up That's and it, you like... gotta catch it the amazing thing about a practice like this is that once we start to work on the habit of doing that it actually gets a lot easier over time as the default neural pathways in your head start to recognize that new protocol and configure themselves around it i'm going to post a link to an article that speaks about this in this week's additional notes. But also if anyone's experienced success with practices like this themselves, then I hope that you'd feel free to share that with us below if you feel comfortable. To finish this piece, I wanted to read out with a really awesome quote that I found that I think sums up a lot of what we've been talking about in this video and will hopefully leave you with a feeling of being juiced up and ready to go. The quote comes from a book I've been really enjoying by George Sanders. He's a contemporary fiction writer and university professor. And in this book, he analyzes three short stories from Russian literature and speaks about the creative techniques that underlie him. In the passage, which I'm gonna paraphrase to close the video, Sanders discusses the transformation of one of the characters in the story, speaking to the heart of some of the central ideas in this video. Transformation, Sanders says, doesn't happen when there's the replacement of some habitual energy with a new, pure and good energy. Transformation happens when we redirect that old energy into something new and better. And what a relief that new model and way of thinking is, Sanders tells us. Because as humans, we only have what we were born with and have always thus far been served and imprisoned by. Say you're a world-class warrior, Sanders writes. 
If that worry energy gets directed to personal hygiene, you're neurotic. If it gets directed at climate change, you're an intense visionary activist. We don't have to become an entirely new person to do better. Our view has to be readjusted. Our natural energy turned in the right direction. We don't have to swear off our powers or repent who we are or what we like to do or are good at doing. Those are our horses. We just have to hitch them to the right sled. And with all that said, I hope some of this was valuable to your practice. If it was, please do consider sharing it with another creator or friend this week. I'm going to put a link to that Rick Rubin series on the screen now if you want to explore these topics further. Do remember there's those additional notes below and that you can sign up to the newsletter if you don't want to miss one of the future uploads. And yeah, thanks for watching and see you next time. Tata, let it go, go, go.